What's up, explorers? This week, we are taking a look at the southern shore of Utah's Great Salt Lake, all because of a secret treasure found in my great-great-aunt Margaret's attic in the 1960s. It's a Christmas miracle. This story involves some cool photography history, the Mormon church, and a rather peculiar outdoor event venue that was plagued by devastating fires. I can't wait to tell you all about it, but first, make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell to get notified of all our future videos. I recently came into possession of a box of Kramer dry plate photo negatives that were discovered in the attic of my great great aunt's Del Rapids, South Dakota home in the 1960s. The box was in decent shape and there was a disclaimer on the back indicating that the plate should be used before August 1901, leading me to believe the negatives contained within dated back to sometime around the turn of the 20th century. Prior to photographic film, glass plates were the predominant capture medium in photography. First came the collodion wet plate process, which required negatives to be exposed and developed while wet, meaning photographers would have to bring a portable dark room with them wherever they went. This was a time-consuming and dangerous process involving extremely flammable and explosive chemicals. In 1871, Dr. Richard L. Maddox invented the dry plate, an improved type of photographic plate that could be exposed anytime and developed at the photographer's leisure. With this new process, bulky equipment was replaced by smaller cameras, even ones that could be disguised as common everyday objects. All in all, dry plates allowed photography to become more widely accessible to the masses. Out of curiosity, I decided to scan some of my dry plates into Photoshop using my flatbed scanner and applying a basic invert filter to see if I could produce an image. While a few of the plates were in a bad state of deterioration, I was able to develop quite a few, and the results were super interesting. My assumption is that most, if not all, the images were taken in the Salt Lake City metropolitan area right at the turn of the century. One of the images was of the Eagle Gate Monument on State Street in Salt Lake City, erected in 1859 and still standing to this day. But the image I was most interested in was one which appeared to be of an ornate palace at the end of a long pier. It was called the Saltair, and it was the first of three large event venues constructed on the southern shore of the Great Salt Lake. Designed by Richard K. A. Kletting, who also designed the Utah State Capitol, the first Saltaire resort was built by the Mormon Church in 1893. The church had two objectives for the venue. First, to provide a wholesome place of recreation for Mormons and their families, and secondly, to be a Coney Island of the West, something to attract tourists and help demonstrate that Utah wasn't a strange place with odd customs. This was part of a bigger strategic plan that Mormon church leaders set in motion in the 1890s to bring the church into mainstream America. Popular attractions included a roller coaster, Ferris wheel, merry-go-round, hot air balloons, and dancing on what was described as the world's largest dance floor. The Saltaire reached its peak popularity in the 1920s, averaging nearly a half million visitors per year. Unfortunately, tragedy struck on April 22, 1925, when a fire broke out on the southern end of the pavilion and burned the entire resort to the ground. A second Saltaire designed by Raymond J. Ashton and Raymond L. Evans was built one year later on the site of the original, but the resort's glory days seemed to be over. The advent of motion pictures, automobiles, and the Great Depression all worked in tandem against the second Saltaire's success. A second fire broke out on July 22, 1931, causing the equivalent of roughly 1.8 million in damages in today's dollars. Saltaire was forced to close during World War II on account of fuel and other resource rationing and losing the bulk of its customers and employees who left Utah to serve in the war effort. It reopened on May 30th, 1945 after a three-year hiatus, but eventually shuttered in 1958 due to its isolated location and alternative entertainment options closer to the city. 
Saltaire II sat vacant for 12 years until being destroyed by arson fire on November 12, 1970. A third Saltaire was constructed out of a salvaged aircraft hangar from Hill Air Force Base, but this time at a new location roughly one mile west of the original Saltaire site. Fluctuating lake levels became an immediate problem and the resort flooded just months after opening. Lake levels receded quite rapidly over the following years, and Saltaire III sat mostly vacant from the 1990s to mid-2000s. It was purchased by music industry investors in 2005 and has been holding regular concerts ever since. Today, the shoreline of the Great Salt Lake sits roughly a half mile away from Saltaire III, with the lake reaching a record low level in July 2021. When I traveled through Salt Lake City last month, I set out to explore the site of the original Saltaire Resort, which is situated approximately 15 miles west of the city on the southern bank of the Great Salt Lake. I'll put specific coordinates in the description below, but the site is now part of the Lee Creek area, managed by the National Audubon Society, and is accessible via a small entrance off Interstate 80. All that remains today of the original Saltaire is a roughly one mile row of wood pilings that made up the railway trestle and pier leading to the resort. Now, there's probably no one alive today that remembers visiting the original Saltaire Resort. But if you remember visiting Saltaire too, we'd love to hear about your experience. Please be sure to share with us in the comments down below. Thanks so much for tuning in and until next time, remember to get out and explore.